State government in the off season, or is it? We're going to find out on this edition of Meet the Leaders in just a moment. Hi there, welcome to Meet the Leaders. I'm David Smith. Today's guest is Kim Fawcett. She's a Democrat from the 133rd District representing Fairfield and Westport. And it's great to see you, Kim. How it's are you? It's great to see you, too. It's always, always a pleasure. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> but now, here it is. We're, we're after the fact. Uh, have you got a, a quick reflection on the, the waning stages of the, uh, of the session? Um, Looking back that long month back? Yeah, you know, it was it was actually a pretty, it was our short session, as you know, so this isn't the most productive of the two-year cycle. The short session is a lot of cleaning up, even the budget isn't done from scratch. It's a lot of cleaning up the budget, um, making sure the accounts are balanced, and um, it's probably less interesting for legislators and in, in the general public. It, ha it comes and goes in a couple of months, but we had some good accomplishments. Well, to that end, this, this is the kind of thing that, I mean, during this session, there are a number of vacation periods and so forth. So it's a short session to begin with. Right. Then you take a few weeks off. There are lo some long weekends. Long yeah, weekends. Easter and spring break. And next and thing you know, these hundreds, maybe even thousands of bills that started out back in February, right. long gone. It comes down to uh, the 11th hour, although this year it's not as bad as it has been in years gone by. And all these bills are out the window and nothing right. happens with them. And next go around, if, if you're going back, you're not going back as a representative. No, right. But others will be. And so they start effectively from scratch. Yeah, but keep in mind that all the legislation that we did this year, nothing got through that just started from scratch this year. Okay. Uh, you know, it's they say that most legislative t change in Connecticut takes three to four years to effectively get through the process. So most of the bills we did this year from scratch, you know, having committee public hearings and moving them out, we've worked on them in the past. And so when they show up in those final weeks, they may show up with a little tinkering, a little different than last year, right. but you remember, you know, legislators are familiar with a lot that's before us because it's it's constantly coming back for review. Well, coming back for review all the time, especially in our area and the area that, that you've been representing, is transportation. Yeah. And the transportation ills, and just the other day, uh, we had a stuck bridge that wreaked havoc with not just commuters, but if, if anybody thinks about it, and if you're inland from us, maybe you're not dependent on the trains, but if you're a train hopper from anywhere, the Northeast all the way down to DC, you were stuck. Yeah, no, and in fact, so my husband is a commuter. He commutes to New York City. I think that day it was three hours each way to get in and out, so you're talking a five or six hour commute day. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, on so many levels that it's maddening. But that day in particular, what we saw, and probably pretty much all of Fairfield County saw, was that the entire infrastructure shut down, right? Because everybody that got off the trains got on the highways, and the highways, then everybody was, they were, you know, a complete mess, and then everyone was getting off the highways and onto Route 1. Ultimate gridlock. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Nobody could get anywhere for most of the day. And, you know, that's a sign of what we could be facing if Metro North and our, you know, mass transit infrastructure fails, has a, you know, a, a ma massive failure. Well, for us, it is critically important uh, for others in the state and sometimes in state government, it, apparently it is not quite as important right. because funds that are set aside for dealing with situations often go to other places, end up in the general fund or someplace else other than where many people would like to see them go. Right, but keep in mind that the investment dollars that we need to use on somewhere like Metro North, that's not general fund money, that's bonded money, that's long-term investment. And so the problem on that side of the budget equation is we don't even have in place a plan mm -hmm. for you know annual investments that we know we need to make to upgrade the infrastructure. Um, so one of the things I've been fighting for for six years is to get that plan, because right now, if we we continue what we're doing in 30 years all we will have is the exact same infrastructure we have today because our current plan only addresses maintenance and repair it does not address upgrades um, and so what we've been fighting for me and a team of legislators obviously bipartisan because from Fairfield County our voice is not Republican or Democrat it's both of us 
But what we've been fighting for is, hey, let's give us a 10-year funding plan so that we can go back to our constituents and the commuters and give them some hope that we can actually make it permanently safe, that the trains can travel faster and more frequently, and that we can finally deliver to this region's economy uh, a transportation infrastructure that you know supports us. But we, in, in, uh, in talking before the program, you mentioned Transition Connecticut as a uh, as a, an enterprise that is right. working in this direction. Right. So six years ago, I began fighting for the funding so that we could actually develop this long-term infrastructure investment plan. We uh, got the funding in place, took a couple years, and now um, the State Department of Transportation actually hired long-term transportation planners to come in and develop actually a 30-year plan for the whole state that would upgrade our entire state's infrastructure. But within the, that plan, you know, a key component is Metro North. And in the project's called Transform CT. They actually have a social media site. So any Connecticut resident can go on and register their thoughts and concerns and dreams or wishes for what our transportation system can and should be. And the goal is by next January to have some substantial pl a plan in place so that legislators like me and quite frankly Jim Himes and our members of Congress and our, our United States Senators have something to look at so that when they're fighting for us and they're going to the federal government or the state government and we're advocating for funding, we know what the fun how much the funding is we need to replace a bridge or up upgrade catnary. And prioritizing. Lots. We can prioritize it and we can fight for it one step at a time. Well, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what, what comes out of that, of course. And ironically, the money that's sitting there and working for maintenance, maintenance was what apparently caused that difficulty right. the other day that tied up everything. They right. couldn't get it squared away after they maintained it. So uh, we're going to talk uh, housing. We're going to talk about kids and a whole lot more. Okay. Glad to have you with us. Thanks so Thanks much for, for being me. along with us. Uh, Representative Kim Fawcett is along with us on this edition of Meet the Leaders. Got to take a break. We'll be right back with more. I'm one on Lucky Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning is 1 in 750,000. These fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash, 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. And we're back. Meet the leaders. David Smith here with you and Representative Kim Fawcett of the 133rd District, Fairfield and Westport. Talked a little bit about uh, transportation issues and so forth. Uh, affordable housing is something uh, that uh, I have been talking with you and your colleagues about for more years than I care to admit. Right. Uh, are we doing any better? Is there a prospect for any better, especially here in, uh, in Fairfield County? Uh, well, this year I was actually able to chair an affordable housing working group, and we um, took another look at the 830G affordable housing statute because in a lot of instances in a lot of towns throughout Fairfield County, 830G isn't working. It isn't being implemented the way that it was originally intended. What was it to do? It's supposed to um, put incentives in place so that private developers will come in and uh, build affordable housing units. That's the concept, and it's a, it's a good concept. Mm -hmm. um, but with anything, when laws are written, there's sometimes unintended consequences, and um, it's turned into just a, to a negotiation tool. So builders can file an application for 830G, ju just use that as a way to negotiate with the Planning and Zoning Board, and then withdraw it, and they get concessions on planning and zoning 
laws, regulations, but they don't end ultimately end up building the uh, units. They carry the concessions forward, but not necessarily the follow-up right, on the right. affordable housing. And so, um, so the question is, how can we be more targeted or more strategic with 830G and, and um, work better, in, have it work better in communities? And one of the ideas that's out there right now is to develop um, incentive housing zones. So this would be empo completely empower local planning and zoning boards, allow them to determine the zones, and it could be anywhere within the community, but them to determine the zones that um, you know, have more dense housing and more affordable housing. But in doing that, there would be you know, some requirements that those kind of concessions aren't made, that you, know, you wouldn't have it all over town, you wouldn't have these kind of negotiations going on with the builders, that they would be building in these specific zones. So this, this is something that could be pending next go around? It came up this year, we had a hearing, a lot of conversations, and um, it's just a very difficult issue. It's one, to, to, one thing to discuss it, but then to get it on paper in, and into statute so that it is implemented correctly is, has been tricky. Next session, maybe. Next session, ne hopefully, maybe. yes. Uh, children's issues are something that you have done a lot of focusing on, and, uh, and concussion is something, not just kids. This, right. is, this is something that has been a huge national and indeed international uh, crisis of late, the focusing at long last on the realities of concussion. Right, and I have two student athletes, actually daughters, in high school, and both have had concussions really? in the past 18 months. Um, and so I have lived through this process. Yeah. And yeah, this year, we are really lucky in Connecticut because some um, incredibly uh, actively engaged moms in Westport who also had personal experiences with concussions and their, their teenagers formed something called the Parents Concussion Coalition. And they um, were focused and they really wanted to see legislative change in Connecticut. And I was so really just incredibly fortunate to be able to partner with them back in January. We had a public hearing. We got that bill. We ushered that bill through several committees. What is it to do? So the bill ultimately did get through the House and the Senate. The governors were waiting for him to sign it. But the bill um, actually specifically says now that uh, athletic directors have to inform parents and student athletes of the signs and symptoms of concussion. And while that sounds very obvious, it's not in statute in Connecticut, but it is in statute in almost every other state. Mm. And we have a really a top-notch training program for our um, coaches and our athletic directors. That's the key, of course. Of course. but. You know, ex exactly the example of when my daughter's concussion occurred, the coach handled it brilliantly and did everything he's supposed to do. And what he's supposed to do is get her out of the situation and call me. And, and I came in and took her to the hospital. So there's got to be a component where we're educating the parents on signs, symptoms, care, and the aftermath, and when to return to play. And so now that uh, parent piece and that student education piece are going to be part of concussions and student athletes. That training is a, is, a, is the major uh, piece of that. Yeah, and, uh, I know it helped me. My one of my daughter's concussion just happened, literally while we were moving this bill through the process. Oh I gosh. was spending the night before in the emergency room with my daughter diagnosed as a concussion, which is just a coincidence, but you know, strange, a strange play of events. Talk about firsthand impressions, no question. Hey, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for good, having me. Good to see you. Wish you the best going forward. Uh, it's Representative Kim Fawcett, uh, who has been representing the 133rd District of Westport and Fairfield. That's all the time we've got on this edition of Meet the Leaders. I'm David Smith. We'll look for you next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check out this chef, right? <laughs> right? That's so gay. That's really gay. Dude, look at those pants. Please don't say that. What? Don't say that something is gay when you mean that something is dumb or stupid. It's insulting. It's like if I thought this pepper shaker was stupid and I said, man, and this pepper shaker is so 16-year-old boy with a cheesy mustache. Just saying. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off.
love you, Dad.